The so-called bomb cyclone crippling the East Coast, dumping heavy snow from the Carolinas to Maine. At least six people are dead, 100,000 without power, with 58 million people in the storm's path. And tomorrow, temperatures will struggle to stay above zero degrees across the Midwest and Northeast. We've got our eye on that for you and so much more at this hour. Including an even bigger story on the U.S. economy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sandra Smith in for Martha McCallum tonight. History made again. The New York Stock Exchange with no apparent end in sight. For the very first time, not only did the Dow hit 25,000 points, it stayed there. Closing above that extraordinary mark, the excitement palpable at the start of trading. Stand by for glory, ladies and gentlemen. We are a mere 13 seconds away from what we think could be the opening bell ringing on Wall Street to greet 25,000. There it is. Man, that graphic goes fast. Dow, 25,000, halfway between 20K and 30K, a uh, little less than a year. Dow just cost 25,000 for the first time. Stocks are higher due to the release of stronger than expected jobs data. And at 4 p.m. Eastern time today, it became official. The Dow making history once again, closing above 25,000 for the first time ever. One report noting the near meteoric rise since President Trump took office. Quote, consider that it took the Dow 14 years to climb from 10,000 to 15,000 and three and a half years to reach 20,000. The ride from 20 to 25,000, not even 12 months. Don't blink or you'll miss another landmark. The news of the Dow surge not lost on President Trump, who has now set a brand new goal. We broke a very, very big barrier, 25,000. And there were those that say we wouldn't break 25,000 by the end of the eighth year. And we're in the 11th month. We did, in fact, break 25,000, very substantially break it very easily. So I guess our new number is 30,000, uh, but what, I, what it means is every time you see that number go up on Wall Street, it means jobs, it means success, it means 401ks that are flourishing. Here now, Mark Short, White House Director of Legislative Affairs. So Mark, next stop, 30,000? Well, Sandra, we're obviously excited with the market. Uh, it shows, I think, enthusiasm and, uh, and support for the president's agenda, particularly what we've been able to do on the regulatory front. But we're also excited to be delivering tax relief to middle-income families. We think they're going to begin seeing a lot of the uh, benefits as well. In addition to the stock number, as you mentioned, unemployment's at a 17-year low. Unemployment for Hispanics is an all-time low. And now, since the tax reform package was passed, 920,000 Americans, 920,000 Americans, Americans have either received a bonus or increased wages from companies that have announced uh, benefits to those employees. The, 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 president, Pelosi, the president, Mark, takes a lot of credit for this. I mean, we see him yeah. tweeting about it uh, a lot, and rightly so. It's, it's exciting for the American people to see the stock market going up like that. But President Obama, I remember back in December, he took credit for it. He said this is a result of his years of policies. You know, so what, to what specifically has the president done in his first sure. year of office that, that he can take credit for this enormous rise in the stock market? Well, Sandra, I think it's a couple of things. One, again, I think it's rolling back the regulatory burden that was here during the Obama years. I think that that's been significant and has given investors a lot of encouragement. I do think that the tax plan has certainly provided relief. Lowering the corporate rate has helped to bring jobs back to America. And as I said, providing that sort of the, all those bonuses to American workers, Nancy Pelosi said the tax plan would be economic Armageddon. Well, not one Democrat voted for it. I hope those 920,000 workers who receive those benefits remember that in November. Well, I want to throw the, the president's most recent tweet up on the screen because it was about 10 minutes ago that he tweeted this. Thank you to the great Republican senators who showed up to our meeting on immigration reform. We must build the wall, stop illegal immigration, end chain migration, and cancel the visa lottery. The current system is unsafe and unfair to the great people of our country. Time for change. So now that tax reform is done, Mark, how do you prioritize the legislative goals of this White House. What is going to be the next big fight? 
Well, we've always wanted to solve the DACA problem. The president had put forward uh, last fall a uh, proposal to Congress that here's what we want in exchange for providing certainty for those uh, participants in the deferred um, plans for those who arrived here as illegals. So we're looking to, to solve that problem. But I think there's also budget that needs to be approved. You know, budget usually is approved by the end of September. The president puts forward his budget in February, and then the appropriations process happens. Here we are now in January without a deal. Our national security security is in jeopardy with Congress not being able to pass funding to help to provide funds for our troops and, and help to provide security for our country. That's obviously an issue, Mark, and that deadline's quickly approaching to fund the government January 19th. And you just had Chuck Schumer, leading Democrat, say we have leverage going into this. And as you know, he wants DACA tied into the, to, to whatever happens there. So what is the leverage that Democrats have going into this? Well, the reality is that we need 60 votes in the United States Senate. And so we are going to need to get Democrat support and have this be bipartisan. Uh, what we find confounding is why Democrats don't want to make sure that our troops are funded and to make sure our country is safe and providing funding for the government. We also want a solution for DACA. But why they're getting married together remains confusing to us. So we think it's important that we go ahead and get a budget caps deal and that we fund the government, take care of the, the people that we need to take care of and make sure that our country is safe. We also want to solve DACA, but tying them together is just going to, I think, So you say they have no leverage with DACA making it into well, the, the funding? That no, I, I think that there is leverage because the reality, as I said, is we need 60 votes. What I think is frustrating and difficult to understand is to why, if we're all supporting the need to get a budget cap deal in place, why tangential issues are thrown in and our troops are held hostage over those issues. We think DACA should be solved. We want a solution. We've put forward our proposal to Congress. We're waiting for them to come back with legislation for us, but to tie the whole the whole hands of the United States government and our troops and hold it hostage to a solution on a problem for illegal immigrants immigrants is difficult for us to understand. Well, it's great to get you on tonight specifically to talk about the economy and this soaring stock market. It seems to be getting lost. You know, you're not hearing a lot about that, and the president um, accurately notes that, but we're covering it here because it is you something are. that affects the American people. Mark Short, yeah, thanks for coming on tonight. Thanks for having me on, Sandra. I appreciate From it. the White House. Joining us now, Mark Thies, an American Enterprise Institute scholar and a Fox News contributor, and Zach Petkanis, a former senior DNC advisor and Hillary Clinton campaign aide. Mark, I'll start with you first. You know, why not celebrate that? Sure. Our retirement accounts are tied to the American stock market. Um, this is the result of sure. taxes going down, jobs growth. Uh, you just heard from Mark, there, there are a lot of good things happening in this economy. Absolutely. We should all be celebrating when the economy is, is booming, whether we're Republicans or Democrats. And look, it's not just the stock market. Unemployment, as you pointed out, is down to a 17-year low. 1.7 million jobs created uh, in, the, in this past year. We've had two quarters now of above 3 percent uh, economic growth. And the New York Fed has projected that the last quarter of, this, of last year is going to be at 4 percent growth. And we'll have a third quarter. And the first quarter of this year will be mm. above 3 as well. The last time we had four straight quarters, of above 3% economic growth was 13 years ago. It's been anemic, uh, so this, that's this for sure. this economy is booming. And there it's was that booming, feeling we that we didn't have a business-friendly environment. And that's why, you know, you saw Donald Trump step in, run for president, and, and there were so many people and businesses that just wanted a friendlier environment. And Zach, I think you're probably going to pour cold water somehow on all this. <laughs> I, I, I am. I mean, look, it is objectively <laughs> good that the uh, stock market is, is, is doing well right now. But to suggest that this is some sort of spectacular growth in the last year is just not backed up by the facts. Where are you not? Uh, what are you not seeing? So, for, ex <laughs> for example, I mean, there was a 26 percent growth in the Dow um, when, since, since Obama, since uh, Donald Trump came into office. When, since Obama came into office during his first year from, from Inauguration Day to this point in his presidency, it increased by 33 percent. The S&P 500 increased by 37 percent during the same time versus Trump at 18 percent. And so, I, again, it is great that we're that the stock market is, is doing well. It is not doing as well as it was in terms of growth under the first year of Obama. All right. So you're seeing a record <laughs> stock market, though. You're seeing sur a surge in this market that we've never seen before. And you've got a president that's talking about it going up another 5,000 from here. And, and Mark, I'll tell you what, I look at a lot of these Wall Street notes. And there are profits at major corporations, American companies, to back up the gains that we've seen in the stock market. But, but I will ask you this. I probably should ask Mark Short this as well. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger with the president tying his policy wins 
so closely to the stock market when it's only one gauge of the economy? I mean, surely there could be yeah. a correction. There could be a 10, 15 percent sell off. And that, honestly, sure. that would still be healthy to see for this stock market. It would actually indicate a healthier rally. But if he so closely aligns sure. himself with the stock market, is that a problem? Well, if that was the only indicator that was going, then then that would be a problem. But as I pointed out, all the indicators are, are the, uh, that, are, that we're going full speed. Again, two quarters of 3% economic growth. We're going to have a, a fourth quarter. The fourth quarter of next year is going to be expected to be 4%, another quarter at 3%. The Obama average was less than 2% economic growth. So nobody's pining for the days of the Obama economy. We also have and in fact, what you're hearing, if you read the financial press today, if you read the financial press today, what we're hearing are concerns that the economy may actually be overheating that it may be growing too fast. We never heard anybody worrying about overheating under That's the Obama economy. That's a reasonable economy. concern. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's a... Yeah. But, but, so, right, so we, I think we, it's we also a, it's a little bit rich to be going back and saying how great things were under so let's, Obama. Let's like, All right, Zach, again, get back in here. I, no, I mean, look, again, like these things, the indicators are, are, are good, but it's not, it's certainly not spectacular. Again, we've had, the, we've had uh, the, a, the, the slowest job growth that we have had in 2017 since 2011. Well, things are good, but they're not like... I'll tell you what is good, Zach. In, in the, in, in, in the days true. following that tax reform getting done, AT&T handing out $1,000 bonuses to 200,000 bits of People. Boeing, $300 million investment, increasing corporate giving. It's affecting charitable giving. Comcast, $1,000 bonuses to its employees. Fifth Third Bank, raising their minimum wage on their own. The government not telling them to do it, raising their minimum wage employees to $15 an hour, among other things, and directly attributing to this. So these are things you have to point out. But obviously, there is always a concern that anything could throw a wrench in the system. Thanks to both of you for being here. Thank you. All right. Steve Bannon agreed to keep quiet when he left the Trump campaign. But what if he broke the deal? Can the president sue to block his story from getting out? Or is this a clear cut case of exercising free speech? Constitutional law professor Jonathan Turley is here to explain the legal options on both sides. And they may surprise you. And nobody saw this coming. Is the Department of Justice finally ready to lock her up? Jason Chaffetz and Marie Harp are here to respond to some explosive new rumors that could prove President Trump was right. Hillary is likely to be under investigation for many years, probably concluding in criminal trials. Breaking tonight, tomorrow, House Intel Committee members will finally be able to see those last documents they've been requesting from the DOJ for months regarding records and testimony from witnesses in the Russia investigation. This as more emails released to Judicial Watch stray from Anthony Weiner's personal laptop sent by his wife, Huma Abedin. At the time, we'd love to show you what they said, but most are completely unreadable thanks to heavy redactions by the feds. Can you blame them? The information is classified, but apparently not classified enough to charge Huma Abedin with a crime. And also today, there are new reports that the Trump Justice Department may reopen the Clinton email investigation. Trace Gallagher is live at our West Coast newsroom with the story. Hey, Trace. Hey, Sandra, the Daily Beast is reporting that an ally of Attorney General Jeff Sessions tells them the AG is very interested in finding out exactly how Hillary Clinton and her aides handled classified material, including how much classified information was sent over Clinton's private email server and who put the information into an unclassified environment. Meantime, Clinton supporters are already out in force saying, here we go again, with her communications director, Nick Merrill, saying that in the wake of Steve Bannon's explosive comments about the president and his family that Mr. Trump is now resorting to diversion and distraction with the help of his attorney general. Though the president has clearly been sounding this email horn for quite some time. It was even a major narrative of his campaign. Remember this back and forth? Watch. If I win, I am going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look into your situation, because there has never been so many lies, so much deception. It's just awfully good that someone with the temperament of Donald Trump is not in charge of the law in our country. Yeah, because you'd be in jail. 
There is also evidence the Department of Justice under President Trump began asking Congress two months ago for information concerning Hillary Clinton's email scandal. Brian Fallon, who's a former spokesman for the DOJ and for the Clinton campaign, says this sets a dangerous precedent, saying, quote, the Justice Department should not be opening itself up to the perception that it is bending to political pressures from the White House. In other words, that Trump is bullying the DOJ. Conservatives have a much different take, saying that despite former FBI Director James Comey repeatedly opening and closing the email probe, it was never adequately investigated. Tom Fitton, who heads up Conservative Judicial Watch, which also sued the State Department to gain access to emails, says he believes there is enough evidence to reinitiate the investigation. We called the DOJ for a comment. They have not yet gotten back to us. Sandra. All right, Trace Gallagher, thank you. Here with more, Jason Chaffetz, former House Oversight Committee chairman and led the charge in the Clinton email investigation. And Marie Harf, a former Obama State Department spokesperson. Both are Fox News contributors. And you know, I saw you guys in the green room <laughs> on my way up here. You were fired up. So bring it. What do you think? <laughs> No, look, there's a new fact pattern in place. The attorney general should be looking at this. I think Jeff Sessions is actually about 10 months late to looking at this. But you've uncovered a number of things with the inspector general, Michael Horowitz, and the 450 people he has at the DOJ. I think the, the Department of State is worried about what the inspector general is looking at. And then you have Congress and both the House and the Senate also unveiling and uncovering more documents and more information. Devin Nunes and, and Trey Gowdy and... and Tom Rooney and the people in the, in the Intel Committee, they shouldn't have to negotiate a, a duly issued subpoena. This was supposedly a closed case. They should have provided all the documents back when the original subpoena was issued in August. It's unbelievable. And when you look at those emails and the fact that we can't even read them, Marie, Huma Abedin's, um, they had to redact so much because obviously they're classified emails. How is she not charged with a crime? Well, the Department of Justice and career prosecutors, career investigators have been working on this for months now. And yes, there are some high profile cases of people that we've talked about that uh, had conflicts and that aren't part of investigations now because of that. But I don't think that we should, you know, tarnish the entire investigation because some people don't like the outcome. And, and I think that uh, Hillary Clinton's spokesperson was actually right when he said, the Department of Justice cannot look like it is bending to political pressure from the White House. And every time Donald Trump says, look into this, you know, Jeff Sessions should look into this, DOJ should look into this, it gives the appearance that there are politics at play. Is that fair? And is you, that fair? No, no, well, but it gives that appearance. No, but, but that's the response from the Hillary Clinton camp. Brian Fallon, her fo former yeah. spokesperson, responded. He said this is extremely danger dangerous. It leads to the perception that is uh, that they are bending to political pressures from the I White think House. It does. The, I think it does. The imperative should be to get to the truth. And when it was uncovered that the, that the FBI director and the host of people around him we're making this decision and writing drafts exonerating Hillary Clinton before they had interviewed some 16 witnesses. Uh, that's absolutely wrong. And when you look at Trey, uh, Trey Gowdy and John Ratcliffe, career prosecutors, and they look at this case and say the FBI did this case absolutely different and out of style and out of protocol than any other case they've ever seen. So, so That's why Congress does oversight. So Jeff Sessions, I'm happy and, and happy for him to look at the file from the investigation, to have career folks who work under Democrats and Republicans walk him through the investigation mm -hmm. and how they got to the answer they did. What I don't like is if you don't like the answer politically, then somehow when a new party's in power, you reopen investigation. All right. I, all right. That is what I don't I like. I feel like we're, we're, time's going so fast here. There's so <laughs> okay. much that we have not We can talk on. about this all day. So the Nunes deal on the dossier reached an agreement with the DOJ to turn over these outstanding document witness requests related to the Russia investigation. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about that, but I also want to show you this tweet, or sorry, this poem that Maxine Waters, Democrat from California, <laughs> uh, tweeted about the special counsel Robert Mueller jailing members of the Trump camp. A message to Mueller, stay strong and stand tall. Continue to investigate them all. You are indeed answering the people's call. The Kremlin clan is going to fall. Around you, the Democrats are building a wall. We look forward to the day to prison. They will all be hauled. That's the, that's the political grandstanding that the left is using to raise money. And, and that, that's what's wrong. It's not based on facts. It's based on a poem. And she's put herself out there on this witch hunt. That is just well, she's absolutely. She's called for the president's but judgment on multiple occasions. I don't occasions, think we right? should let this one congresswoman's rhetoric distract from the fact that the Russia invest investigation is serious. It's looking at serious allegations, and nothing may come from it in terms of collusion. But we have an obligation 
to run, let the investigation run its course. And we can't let this crazy rhetoric stand in the way of that. All right, I've got to get this in. Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan uh, are both calling on Attorney General Jeff Sessions, saying it is time for him to step down, citing recent leaks from the Justice Department and the FBI, uh, saying Attorney General Jeff Sessions has recused himself from the Russia investigation, but it would appear he has no control at, at all the premier law enforcement agency in the world. Yes, Attorney General Sessions, his time has come. He's got to go. I, I, I agree with Meadows and Jordan on this. He's not existed in this investigation. He's irrelevant, and I think it was a bad pick, and it's time for him to I go. I know you felt like that for a while. Marie, I mean, last word. What's so crazy is Jeff Sessions is incredibly conservative. He has supported the president on a number of his policies when it comes to the Department of Justice. It's so fascinating to me that conservative members of Congress want to throw him under the bus because he recused himself and because of, of leaks that are happening in the government. He's on their side on policy. It's this fascinating place he's where he's non-existent. He's non-existent, and when there are major systemic problems in the Department but of Justice, and they're not fixing them, that's why he's got to go. He's pursuing policies they support. Got to get the right person. See, I told you guys, you guys, they're all fine. We like each other. We get along. We get along. We just disagree on everything, but right. we get along. But we like each other. Yeah. All right. Good to see you both. I know you had long days, so thanks for being here. All right. Coming up, she was criticized for being one of the last women in Hollywood to call out Harvey Weinstein. But now, Meryl Streep coming forward to call out the women in Trump's family because they haven't done enough. And the Bannon bombshell, book bombshell fallout moving at lightning speed tonight. Trump now threatening to sue to silence his former advisor. Does he have a case? Constitutional law professor Jonathan Turley has the answer. Then Governor Huckabee with insider scoop on the real story behind the betrayal. Do you think Steve Bannon has a defamation case against President Trump? I, I will tell you this, I've got it on pretty good authority that he is considering that. Did Steve Bannon betray you, Mr. President? Thank you very Any much. words about Steve Bannon? I don't know, he called me a great man last night, so, you know, he obviously changed his tune pretty quick. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. That's just a misnomer. That was President Trump further distancing himself tonight from his former chief strategist in the wake of that bombshell new book on the Trump White House. This comes as the president is now demanding the author and publisher of Fire and Fury stop production and apologize. Trump lawyer is sending a letter saying, quote, Mr. Trump hereby demands that you immediately cease and desist from any further publication. And late this afternoon, we learned Steve Bannon is now reportedly considering a defamation suit against the president. Do either have a case? Here now, Jonathan Turley is constitutional law attorney and George Washington law professor. Uh, good to see you, professor, this evening. Thank you. So, so first up, does the president have a case? Not really. I mean, I, I, this is a very unlikely type of challenge if it was ever actually brought into court. Uh, asking for a prior restraint in the strongest case has a low likelihood of success. Um, this is not a particularly strong case. Much of what has been attributed to Mr. Bannon is opinion, uh, but more importantly, um, this is the scourge of Washington. Tell-all books have been around since the early republic. I don't blame presidents for being upset with people like Bannon who leave service and immediately dump on uh, the administration. Uh, but he does have First Amendment rights, and I think this is going to create rather bad optics with little chance of success. But one really important distinction that you make in your column is regardless of whether or not the president has a case, when you read through that lengthy letter by Trump's personal lawyers, it's certainly putting Steve Bannon on notice. It is. And in some ways, the attorney in sending this letter uh, is also looking down the road. He has not presumably seen the book. Uh, he doesn't know what Bannon is going to be saying. And so this is a shot across the bow and saying, we believe you've already crossed that line and we are prepared to sue you uh, if you continue to make defamatory statements. It's just that it's not a very compelling threat. With a public official, the Supreme Court has established a very high standard for defamation called the New York Times versus Sullivan standard. And that requires knowing uh, falsehood or knowing disregard uh, 
or reckless disregard of the truth. Uh, it's a standard that's very hard to make, and it's designed so that people can say bad things about public officials. And in, the, in the case of the non-disclosure agreement with Bannon, you also make the case that it's very different when it comes to, say, when Trump was having someone, when he wor they worked for his company, sign them, versus then somebody who works inside the White House for the government sign those. Now, in the case of Steve Bannon, reportedly bringing a suit against the president, huh. would he have a case? Nope. Uh, he doesn't have a case either. So this is a, this is a, something of a, of two guys making threats, and neither is very compelling. I think Bannon's even less compelling. Uh, what the president said about Steve Bannon is opinion, and Steve Bannon may no longer be a public official. He's a public figure, and he falls under the very same standard in terms of uh, the constitutional standard for defamation. Uh, the the likelihood of his succeeding against the president is infinitesimally small. Professor Turley, it is great to get your insights <laughs> on that. Thanks for being here. Thank you. This Trump-Bannon battle can best be summed up in a Politico piece titled, Bannon was shot on the South Lawn and run over by a tank, which says in part, quote, the dramatic collapse on Wednesday of the shaky alliance between President Donald Trump and his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, marked perhaps the most vicious falling out between a president and former aide in modern history. Here now, Governor Mike Huckabee. He's also a Fox News contributor, and he's also a study of history, a good one at that. Uh, would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I think it uh, was probably Steve Bannon's worst moment. I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know why on earth he thought that this was a good strategy. Uh, this really comes down to something bigger than the legal issue. And I think the professor was spot on, almost impossible ever to win a lawsuit if you're a public figure. You just, just about can't do it. But here's something that ought to govern these things. Honor, honor and decency, which when you go out after having been put in a position of trust. I'll, I'll call it the Robert De Niro circle of trust, if you remember the movie Meet the Parents. And once you get out of that circle of trust, you never get back in it. But if you're put in it, then you have, I believe, a moral obligation to honor the trust of the person mm. who puts you in that position. And Sandra, it's very disturbing to me that people get into a political job and then they want to make money off of it by mm. going and telling a bunch of stuff. And, and frankly, whether it's true or not is immaterial. Two things you give to someone if you take a job like this. One is your loyalty and two is your confidentiality. And if you can't take those two virtues to the job, you should never do it. And if you violate them, then you have no honor and you should never have been in those positions to begin with. Well, it's remarkable then to just see him out there, you know, and in, in in one of the only responses that we've seen from Bannon since all of this came out. He's a, he's a good man, he said of the president. Well, I think that's probably, I'd like to believe, it's what he thinks. But it's interesting to me to watch the media on the left. I mean, just a few days ago, Steve Bannon was a Nazi. He was a, you know, goose-stepping goon. And then suddenly he's now the source for these negative things about the president, and he's a hero to the very people who were calling him everything but a decent human being. I mean, that to me is the great irony in all of this. It's not so much this trashy book that's been put out, most of which I think will be discredited, and people who have been quoted have said, I didn't say those things. Uh, but the bigger issue is why does the left pretend that they suddenly like Steve Bannon when in fact they have called him everything but a decent human being up until they think he's responsible for trashing Donald Trump. It is amazing to see how uh, their tune has changed, isn't it? One other quick thing, yes. a veteran Republican strategist, Ed Rollins, uh, who said Bannon was shot on the South Lawn, run over by a tank, and the president shifted in gear and ran him over again. Uh, but he said Bannon saw his role as a lot bigger than it ever was and that it ever would be. He said that was really the problem um, that, that, that broke these two apart. They could never decide really who, who had more power. Well, candidates win elections, candidates lose elections. When political consultants and operatives think it's all about them, they really have disqualified themselves from being in the position. They're the ones who, whether the candidate wins or loses, they take a 
vacation on the Riviera because they still get paid. The candidate's figuring up how to pay his mortgage if he loses, and there's nobody returning his calls. So, you know, I, I get really put out with uh, political operatives and people who are consultants who think it's all about them and that they are the ones who win the campaigns. Well, let them get their own names on the ballot and let's see how big they are. That's, that's my message to them. If you're that good, then get your name on the ballot, you run, you win, you serve, and get evaluated for how well you do it. It's really been something to watch. Governor Huckabee, thank you for being here tonight. Thanks, Sandra. Good to talk to you. All right. Well, still to come, President Trump sends a powerful new message to those who still think kneeling during the national anthem protest is a good idea. But first, more proof of the dirty tactics of the firm behind that anti-Trump dossier. As the company claims they are the real victims in all of this, this man says Fusion GPS tried to ruin his life, planting fake stories calling him everything from a pedophile to a drug trafficker. Alex Boyd tells his story next. They produced huge amounts of information, fake information about me, accusing me from being a pedophile to being an extortionist. Breaking tonight, we could soon know who paid the firm behind that infamous anti-Trump dossier within the last hour. A federal judge denying the company's request to quash a congressional subpoena from the House Intelligence Committee to provide bank records as part of its investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 election. It comes a day after the founders of Fusion GPS wrote an op-ed claiming they were the real victims in the Russian collusion case. But tonight, another one of their alleged victims is speaking out about the firm's smear and intimidation tactics. Venezuelan journalist Alec Boyd says that after he criticized one of Fusion's clients, he was labeled a pedophile, drug trafficker, extortionist, and even a homosexual spreading AIDS. Here now to tell his story, Alec Boyd. Alec, thank you for coming on tonight. So what was your experience with this firm? Well, um, Fusion was basically hired to work for a group of Venezuelan white-collar criminals called Derwick Associates. Uh, in the course of my work as an investigative journalist, I expose rampant corruption uh, related to this Venezuelan group of people, and Fusion GPS was retained to basically block and obstruct any further criticism on the media, whether from independent bloggers or from large media uh, organizations such as the Wall Street Journal. So upon their visit in Caracas to try and, and convince the Wall Street Journal that their clients were upstanding captains of industry, uh, my flat in London was uh, bre broken into. My, the laptops that I had uh, were stolen. Uh, pictures of my children were left, uh, along with uh, threatening messages of sexual abuse. And I believe that Fusion GPS had a hand in doing all that. So what do you make now, of, and you, I'm sure you've seen this, this recent op-ed that the two co-founders uh, both wrote, they went on the attack, um, uh, Devin Nunes, the House Intel chair, uh, specifically naming him, accusing him of trying to tarnish our firm to punish us for highlighting Donald Trump's links to Russia. What do you make of them saying we're the victims in all of this? Um, I, I don't think anyone can tarnish them or, or their firm. Uh, they have tarnished themselves by associating themselves with the likes of Venezuelan white criminal crooks, with the like of Putin's agents, with uh, murderers effectively from Russia. If, if, if we recall uh, their work on behalf of some uh, Russian parties to have uh, to quash the Magnitsky Act in the United States, um, their work speaks for themselves. So it's, it's not a matter of whether Devin Nunes or, or the media is trying to portray, put, you know, to put them out of business. It's themselves and their associations and their illegality what is putting them and will eventually, hopefully, put them out of business. So they put themselves out there. Fusion GPS is a Washington-based research firm run by former, former journalists, which many of them are. Um, this is who they say they are. Who do you say is the real Fusion GPS? Uh, they're they're con artists. Basically, they are they are aiding and abetting criminals. And you know, as the old saying, "Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are." Uh, as far as the Venezuelan uh, uh, the Venezuelan paymasters, uh, this is a group of people 
that are on the run. Some of them have their offices have had have been raided recently in Venezuela. The people that facilitated the contracts to the contract to the company that contracted Fusion GPS are in jail. Others are on the run. So these are the kinds of these are the kinds of clients that Fusion GPS has sought to cultivate over the years. So I don't believe for a second that they are victims of anything. I am a victim. Uh, my family has been a victim. Bill Browder is a victim. I don't think they can say that they are a victim. That is just preposterous. And that op-ed that they published in the New York Times requesting uh, the testimonies to be published, I, I should say that the whole world will certainly benefit from knowing exactly what they say during closed doors, you know, while, while they're testifying behind closed doors. But we will also benefit from knowing exactly what they've done for clients, such as the Venezuelan group that I just mentioned, Derwick Associates, and from Russian clients that they've had. And also from, you know, if, if they could divulge how come they were working for the Clinton campaign and Russian interests at the same time? They conveniently, come... they conveniently left that out of the op-ed, didn't they? Um, well, of course, of course. They yeah. never mentioned that. Neither them nor their apologies in the Washington Post and in some other media. So none of these things are ventilated, you know, by this so-called, um, you know, diehard bleeding liberals. But at the end of the day, uh, they have done these things and there is a record of them doing these things and being involved in these things. So, you know, denying or, or, or skirting around the issue is not going to take, you know, it's not going to change the story. Alec Boyd, thank you for coming on and telling your story tonight. Thank you so much, Sandra. Still to come. It's no secret Academy Award winning actress Meryl Streep isn't a fan of the president. But now she's going after the first lady and his daughter, Ivanka. Is that fair? Dana Lash takes that one on next. Well, it's no secret that Meryl Streep is no fan of President Trump, but now the Hollywood icon is going after the women of the Trump family, criticizing them for not speaking out as sexual harassment scandals and the Me Too movement sweep across the nation. Streep saying in a new interview, quote, I don't want to hear about the silence of me. I want to hear about the silence of Melania Trump. I want to hear from her. She has so much that's valuable to say. And so does Ivanka. I want her to speak now. That didn't go over well with the Trump family. Don Jr. firing back on Twitter saying, quote, amazing that the only person in all of Hollywood who didn't know Weinstein was a serial assaulter, of course she did, has an opinion on this. Here now, Dana Lash, a radio talk show host and a conservative commentator. Does she have a leg to stand on, Dana? Uh, Sandra, it's good to be with you. No, I don't think that she does. And I want to remind all of your viewers as well that Ivanka Trump, when she was talking about those who prey on women and girls, she had harsher words to say about Roy Moore than Meryl Streep has ever had to say about Harvey Weinstein or Roman Polanski or Woody Allen. Meryl Streep is at the apex of Hollywood, and it is ludicrous for anyone to think or for her to expect anyone to think that she was completely ignorant of Harvey Weinstein's serial predation of women. In fact, I dare say that Meryl Streep, through her silence, and of course, you know, she's won many awards for many Weinstein movies in which she starred, including The Iron Lady, which I believe was the most recent. But Streep's silence on all of this, Sandra, has actually helped to marginalize, in my and probably reality's opinion, all of the victims of Harvey Weinstein. She, through her silence, has marginalized women. She has enabled predators like Harvey Weinstein in Hollywood because to Meryl Streep, her career was more important than the dignity of so many women in Hollywood. How would you describe the status of that hashtag Me Too movement at this point? I mean, the other night we were talking about um, it, it, it's been diluted in, in, in some ways um, by, mm. by politics and po politicians um, throwing money at chasing down victims to um, bring them up against their opponents. Uh, I mean, what's happening with the movement today? 
Oh, I think you're exactly right in that. And I also think it's used as a deflection by people like Streep who just want to make these political jabs. And I've also seen third wave feminists using it as a way to say, well, I was catcalled one day, which is exactly like being brutally raped or, you know, something else that's unbelievably horrific. The, the, the fear, I think, with the Me Too movement is that it is diluted and that everyday occurrences are being made to look as though everything is sexual assault, everything is sexual harassment, and it's an attack on men. And then, and then what ultimately happens is it diminishes the real struggle and the real tragedy mm -hmm. that actual victims of sexual violence have had to endure, which is unfortunate. And maybe perhaps that wasn't the original goal or the original intent, but if not careful, that could be the ultimate result. And Dana, I wanted to end by sharing this powerful message that the president shared on Twitter early this morning. He tweeted out this picture and said, so beautiful, show this picture to the NFL players who still kneel, clearly showing a grieving military family laying at their family member's gravesite. Last word. That's what it's all about, and that's exactly right. That photo right there is why people honor and, 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 and show honor when the anthem is played at these games. This is the only time, really, that America can all come together and forget about political differences, and they can. the only differences are the color of your jersey uh, mm. or the team that you're rooting for, and that's it. And I think there are plenty of times to show disagreement, but this isn't about disagreement. When, when you do this when the anthem is playing, you're not taking a, left, you're taking a jab at the president. You're taking a jab at the people who fought for it. That's Thank what it is. Thank you for coming on tonight two very powerful messages that we wanted to share. Thanks, Dana. We'll be right back. Thank you. Tomorrow, Martha is back, and she is speaking exclusively to the defense attorney for the illegal Mexican immigrant acquitted in the murder of Kate Steinle. He'll be in court for sentencing on the gun conviction. Will he spend time in prison? Email us at the story at foxnews.com, and I will see you first thing tomorrow morning on America's Newsroom with Bill Hemmer at 9 a.m. and at Outnumbered at noon. Thanks for joining us. Tucker is up next.